ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome um, to uh, our art and social change, uh, a part of our um, social justice uh, First Fridays events. Um, and we're really, really thankful to um, have you all here, especially on a rainy, on a rainy Friday. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Brian Bantam. I teach in the School of Theology. I'm also the, one of the co-directors of the Social Justice Cultural Studies major. Um, and we are really excited to be here. Um, this reflects a kind of, as part of a seri ongoing series of First Friday events, thinking about different aspects of social change, social justice, um, and reflects um, the different, each one reflects different tracks that are inside of the major. So we have free law, we have conflict resolution, we have cultural studies, we have, um, we have an environmental um, track coming up. Um, and of course, art for social change. And so we're really thankful just to be um, here to, this afternoon to listen to a conversation between um, my esteemed colleagues, Professor Laura Lasworth and Professor uh, Karen Kutowski Zimmerman, um, and one of their wonderful students, Lori Forster, who's an illustration major. Um, so please join me in welcoming um, our. Okay, so I'm Laura Lasworth, and I'm going to be talking about um, fine art and social justice, or how fine art engages with issues of justice. And Karen will talk about graphic design and Tori uh, graphic novels and illustration. So I'm, I'm going to highlight uh, work by artist Kara Walker, and um, we're going to look at three Sec three phases of her work. And uh, so let me get it set up here. So this is an early piece of uh, Kara Walker's. This is the work that brought her to national attention. Um, the exhibition is uh, titled Gone, an historical romance of a, civil war, of, of a civil war as it occurred between the dusky thighs of one negress and her heart. And what she did in this body of work was recontextualize the book Gone with the Wind from the point of view of one of the slaves. And it's a very, very, very powerful body of work. And I invite you to look at all of the different imagery that she came up with for this. But it's based on silhouette that was a for, an art form done I during the time of the Civil War. And she would do paper cutouts of these silhouettes and use the plantation owners and the slaves. And you just see you know, babies being ripped away from their mothers. And it's just a, a very theatrical panoramic event when you walk into the museum. The silhouettes are very large. And one of the things that is really quite fascinating, when you're in the museum looking at this body of work, when lights are shown, the, the people in the, in the exhibition looking at it become implicated in the event of this period in history. So our premise is event, encounter, and uh, some sort of empathy occurs. And that's when a leveling. And so we're talking 100, you know, this, after the Civil War, the, up to the time of Kara Walker in her time, uh, trying to come to terms with the historical legacy of slavery. And so this work of art allows for us in the, the modern era or contemporary era to get a glimpse of, the, uh, of this side of this experience and so leveling the, ex the, the injustice that occurred, the implication of we white people in the audience looking become implicated in this historical event in a more truthful way and very empath in, in, a, in a way that empathy does now occur. So the other uh, body of work I want to highlight is uh, what she did in 2014. And I'm going to let her speak in her own words for this. 
And so she went in and made these sculptures out of sugar. And so you have this whole reflection on the period of history where slaves are doing the work on, on sugar plantations. And the, she's sort of, one way we can think of Kara Walker's work is a contemporary history painter. And these history paintings that she does, or history works that she does, are recontextualizing history. And that's where they have such powerful effect on us as an audience. Um, the other part of this body of work that the sculptures were not for sale. They were not for sale. That's really important part of the dynamic here. Uh, because Kara Walker's work gets bought and sold now into a new kind of capitalism uh, with the art market, run mostly by white people. Um, and um, so with this body of work, when the, when the factory was, going, was demolished, so were these, these sculptures. And so she's very, very, very smart about how to take a text, put it in a context that spins how you're understanding what's happening with the subject matter. Kara Walker's work deals with history. Embedded in that statement, Kara Walker's dealing with history is this kind of desire for a hero who can fix this problem of our history and racism. And I don't think that my work is actually effectively dealing with history. I think that my work is kind of subsumed by history or consumed by history. from Creative Time. He said, you have to see this. This place is totally filled with molasses. Molasses on the walls, molasses on the rafters, globs of sugar 50 feet up in the air, just left over from this refining process. It was such a cathedral to the industry and such a cathedral to the own commodity. The whole project is predicated on this space being demolished at the end of the run of the show. I had to learn more about sugar in the process of trying to understand this building. Sugar comes from sugar cane. Sugar cane is grown in tropical climates. Sugar cane is and has been harvested by slaves, underpaid workers, and children possibly. It's a fascinating and very long history. I started putting down all of my free association ideas, starting with sugar and molasses. And molasses is a byproduct of the sugar processing. What other byproducts are there? And I got to the end and I was like, ruins, you know? It was just the ruins, everything was just in ruins. And I couldn't just produce ruins. In this book I was reading about the history of sugar, contemporaries describe something called a sugar subtlety. I love this term. A subtlety is a sugar sculpture made out of sugar paste, marzipan, fruits and nuts, that was you know, sculpted to portray royalty and only could be consumed by royalty, nobility, clergy. The subtlety presents this opportunity to make a figure that can embrace many themes that is representative of power in and of itself. Wow. Wow. I was I was sort of grasping at too many different ideas that I wanted to bring into the piece. Like what don't you want it to look like? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> 
mean, I've never done anything like this before, yeah. so I don't, I don't really have like a really good opinion, you know? From ruins to the sugar subtlety, I don't need to think about the, you know, what sort of figure and what sort of position would she occupy. I think there was a moment of stepping back and ding, you know, oh, what about Sphinx? You know, it was very subtle, actually. <laughs> It's not a kind of Egyptophile relic. This is someone from the New World. Yeah. I was not at all secure about doing sculpture. This was one of those things that was so out of my league that I, I hung back during the sculpting process. We started with a, a clay model. The model was scanned and digitized and created into a file that could be read by carving robots. It's simply one layer that goes on top of the other. We always hear about sculptors liberating the figure from the block. We go back in with the bow wires and basically drag the bow wire across the blocks at angles in order to achieve the curvatures that we're looking for. No matter how incredible robotic carving is, the hand is an element that you can't get away from. And it's, and it's beyond the hand. It's not just the hand. It's, it's what's driving the hand. We're in the process of doing our first test, so we're, we're still very much in the, the discovery phase. I've done a lot of smaller tests, uh, some 12-inch figures, but nothing uh, five feet tall. So it's a mixture of corn syrup, sugar, and water, kind of like what you would use to make caramel or lollipops. So we're boiling it up to between 265 and 290 degrees Fahrenheit. We're pouring them into a rubber mold to let them set. So when we demold them, they will be covered in the sugar and water mixture similar to the Sphinx. I highly recommend a 50 pound bag of sugar for personal therapy, but if you mix it with a couple gallons of water, it's very fun. I mean, it's the most fun I've had since kindergarten, I think, making art. <laughs> I think it was very important to me to have figures made out of a substance that is so temporal, it's so um, subject to change. I really recognize what a privilege it is to be working in that space, because I can think of a thousand other artists who could take on the challenge of that space. I really love the fact of these figures kind of melting and dripping. And they're very much like the interior of the Domino Sugar Factory, which is also still dripping, still producing molasses from its interior, still sort of weeping the substance. Mammy, although she's bent over in this gesture of sort of supplication, I don't feel like she's there to be taken or satisfied or abused in any way. She's sort of withholding. I don't want to make her into a non-sexual caretaker of the city. She's powerful because she is so kind of iconic in a way, and she is so monumental and so unexpected. If I've done the job well, then she gains her power by upsetting expectations one after the other. So I think it's very important to look back.
I don't think we do it often enough. Uh, I think sometimes looking back leads to kind of uh, depression and, and stasis, uh, which isn't good. But um, looking forward without any kind of deep historical feeling of connectedness, it's no good either. So this is um, work from 19, 2017, and um, Roberta Smith says about this work, honing more insistently to her longtime theme, the bitter legacy of slavery in the United States. The work in this assured exhibition unequivocally enter new territories. Narratively, they land solidly where Miss Walker has only lightly tread. The remorseless racialized American present, which is suffused with the death rattle of white male domination and its multiple bigotries. Now she is pushing with new rigor at the boundaries of her primary medium and material, drawing on paper, merging collage, political cartoon, and history painting, and this gives her story uh, line more force. Can we go forward, Scott, to... Uh, uh, to, yeah, there. And we'll, I'm going to stop after this image um, for the sake of time. Um, the show's centerpiece is this enormous Christ entry into journalism, 2017, an 11 by 18 foot collage crowded with over 80 ink drawings of heads and figures. Its titles echo numerous historical depictions of Christ's entry into mm -hmm. Jerusalem. The biblical event preceding his betrayal, de trial, death, and resurrection, but perhaps journalism's death and resurrection is the main point in this, in this piece. The images here are not exclusively contemporary. Note the man resembling the abolitionist Fr Frederick Douglass in the lower left corner. But they implicate current events. Across the top of the piece, a rebus depicts a rope salesman, a white farmer with a noose, a lynched figure and a Ku Klux Klan member whose parted robe reveals a figure in a suit in an extra long tie who could be construed as the current occupant of the White House. And what I love about her work is how incredibly dense it is. And when art works best, for me, I mean, my simple definition of it is that when it works best, it becomes this central point that, that radiates in, with centrifugal force multiple, multiple meanings. And, and uh, I think she is one of the most brilliant artists living right now. And I just strongly encourage you, if she's new to you, please explore her work. And I'm going to stop there and let Karen go. For Hi, I'm Karen. And I, um, I'm a uh, visual communication design profession, professor, so primarily graphic design. Um, and when Laura and I and Tori were talking about this talk, we were kind of trying to theme, you know, how does art speak to social justice? How does art work in social justice or, or um, having the language around social change? And this, this, these words, event, encounter, and create, were really significant in some ways to us. So I thought I would kind of shape my projects along that. It's a little intimidating following Carol Walker because what you're going to see that I did is nothing like Carol Walker. But um, it's a way that maybe, um, especially for the design majors, where we get into a world that's often about poster designs and things like that, a way that you could maybe see yourself being an activist. So if you could go forward, Scott, a couple more. So this was a poster that, when I was all your age in design school, that came out by a gentleman named Chase Mabian Davies. He's um, originally from Zimbabwe. He moved to London, did design school in London, and now lives in the States. And what was significant for me, and, and I love what we talked about, this notion of encounter, was at that particular time, I'd only really thought about design in relationship to commerce, like doing logos, you know, creating things like that. So here was this designer that was making meaning with images that it was an encounter for me. I had the news at that time was very focused on uh, uh, it, it was uh, anti-Palestinian. Uh, it was very pro-Israel. 
Um, and I was really confused by the juxtaposition of barbed wires and hijab. And, and even at that time, I think my interpretation was even a little bit not what Che's desire was, but my encounter in it was, wow, I could use design as a method to make people think or make people uh, be aware of issues of concern. And so it, was, it, 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 it really kind of changed the way I started thinking. Um, next one. So I, um, I kind of liked this quote by Claudia, Claudia Rankin. She's the author of Citizen, American Lyric. She says, how can I say this so that we can stay in the car together? And if I started theming my work, I think it's kind of about that. I don't think I want to jump to large scales and leaps and bounds, but I just want to have conversations, conversations with people. And so I started crafting these experiences that allowed for these conversations. So this was a project, and I have the book here and I'll show it to you, a project that I did in graduate school um, that so when so in this case we're starting to uh, create creating starts an event start by creating and then the event and the encounter follows so I was kind of charged uh, to take a topic that I found in the newspaper and at the time it was during Columbine so there was uh, social unrest uh, high school students weren't getting along you know just all this stuff going on and so. I thought, you know, maybe we just need some conversations. Maybe we need a way to figure out how you and I can have a talk about how we're different. So I had a friend who was doing printmaking at the time, and we set up a project in her high school that two students had to partner together for an entire month, and they were coming from kind of disparate places. One was maybe a cheerleader, and one was kind of, you know, back then you'd call it a stoner maybe, right? Uh, maybe someone was a racially a, a, different, a different race. So we partnered them together. This is how difficult it was. The very first day we said, you know, you and you need to stand, ne sit next to each other for this month and journal. They tried to do it three tables apart. They, they didn't even want to sit next to each other. So every, every day for a month, Scott, you can, we journaled and we made prints. We'll go back to the, sorry, last one. What we did is we started by looking at some stereotypical things like what do people, what, how do I identify myself, what do people call me, what are some of my nicknames. Just really, honestly, it was for nothing but just to have a conversation. And, um, and then what kind of happened out of this conversation is, let's say I was drawing someone that I didn't like. My first drawing might have been kind of nasty. But their drawing of me was really respectful, so I ripped that up, I redid it, and we ended up getting this and beautiful, now you can go, Scott, this kind of beautiful collaged situation of an, a back and forth conversation. So here's the book. It's quite fun. It's quite big. Um, it's quite lovely. And you can look in the book later if you want to see some of the questions that we had in the journal. So the design making, Yes, we could call it a bookmaking project. We could call it a printmaking project. But that wasn't really the goal. The goal was for you and I to have a conversation. And so out of that, it may have impacted 10 people, right? But 10 people really learned about each other. 10 people learned that you like that music, I like that music. Wow, you're challenged, I'm challenged. So that was one experience, and that was one way that I kind of see that conversation in the car together. OK, go for it. So then another project that I've done with a group of students is, so social activism or design for social activism is often we look at terms like human-centered design. So we look at the audience. We look at what the audience is interested, what the audience might participate with. So I started with a group of students, and we, they decided they wanted to deal with the issue of diversity. And how are we on this campus going to have those conversations around diversity? So what we decided to do was we hung out in my office for about three, I mean, each week for three months. And out of that came this idea of a game. You guys all like to game and playing games, playing board games. And so it wasn't that easy because we found that we were uh, maybe asking the wrong questions. Um, not kind of pairing things together. So we did a lot of mind mapping and uh, uh, games with that. But we also, the six of us at least, 
really got to know each other well. We got to know things about each other's culture. Uh, one of our students was Korean. One of our students was African American. Uh, uh, one of our students was Latino, and uh, I'm old, so uh, <laughs> so we we it was really fun. And so yeah, I'll show you. Uh, so the game called Tell Me More. So we crafted these game cards. We crafted a dice. And it's set up that you or I could hang out on a Friday. Well, hopefully, you have a diverse group of people hang out on a Friday night, and it inspires these conversations. And it's a way to get to know each other. OK, next project. So this is another project I've worked. Laura and I, we, uh, we went to the Science March. Uh, and we were having a blast. And we were really so surprised that like non-artists could make signs. I don't know, that was like such a, a revelation for us, right? We're like, oh my gosh, there's all this creation and they're not in the art department. So it was really another like, like kind of a, an odd thing for us. And so out of this, we started having these conversations about, again, exploring more conversations. How do we get people to talk about issues that are concerning them and so forth. So out of that resulted, go for it next, Scott a exhibit that we created. And so in this exhibit, um, and I guess the encounter uh, for the event is, I went through, and you can see Chase, maybe and Davies work over there. I went through and uh, really looked at all of these artists and creators and designers that are really thinking about political change, social change, social dialogue, and how they're using their craft. Next one, Scott. And um, so Emory Douglas was one. He was the Ministry of uh, the Black Panther Culture. Um, uh, Black Panther, wait, no, no, wait, no. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, so he was in the 60s. He was a, a designer that did uh, many of their posters. Um, and uh, the subject matter is so rich. It's about how the Black Panthers really are, uh, are why am I saying Black Panthers? It's, is it Black Panthers? Yeah. Wait, the band, OK, got it. I'm thinking of the movie. Anyways, um, <laughs> it's in my mind. We were just talking about it in history of design today. So then I'm wondering if my titling's up. But he was really talking about how the Black Panthers in the 60s really were dedicated to social causes. They were dedicated to reading, to writing, to bringing food. And these posters all exemplified this. Um, Chase Mavian Davis, who I showed you his first week work, he continually, every day, he sends, you should get on his mailing list, every day he sends out a new poster on social justice. I have one of his books here. Um, prolific designers, not just artists, designers that are using their medium, design thinking, to uh, create conversations about design. And then uh, I happen to be kind of a formalist, and Garland comes from a Swiss background. So he's really, I mean, just sit there and spend time with this black gun spray bottle. <laughs> Think about that. That's, are we erasing in the culture? Are we, what are we doing with that? So this kind of really deep seated iconography um, is really rich. So this surrounded our students. And then next, our students, some of you may have been here at the time, then engaged in a conversation. Engaged in a conversation, we put up these words, concern, equity, identity, culture, and they started talking about these issues that mean something to me. They used iconography that related to themselves, uh, that others could read about. And um, again, I think it really goes back to this, how do we, so as a designer, I've used design as a way to kind of craft a conversation, really, or to get people thinking about issues of concern and social justice and change. So that's me. OK, Tori. Hey. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so first off, thank you to Laura and to Karen and to Dr. Bantam for uh, inviting me to be a part of this today. Um, for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to be working with our three keywords, but kind of going out of order. I'm going to be starting with my encounter and then the event, and then the creation. So if we could go to the next slide, Scott. Thank you. Um, I grew up being told from a very young age that I had a small amount of Native American ancestry. My great-great-grandfather 
was um, a member of the Osage Nation and grew up on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma. But that was it. That was all that I knew. I, outside of that, I, I didn't know anything else about that part of my history. Um, but I'd always been interested in it and wanted to know more. Fast forward to January of 2018, a little over a year ago. Um, as a participant in SPU's University Scholars Program, I and my peers were expected to come up with concepts for a senior research thesis. Um, as an art major, this thesis um, is combined with kind of the senior showcase exhibition that goes on in the spring. Um, the University Scholars Program Director, Dr. Cheney, who I'm sure uh, many of you know, uh, encouraged us all to ask questions that we wanted to know the answer to but didn't already know um, or didn't have any kind of idea of what the answer would be to that question. Um, I've always considered myself a bit of a history geek. I actually started out at SPU as a history major and I realized although that's a field I've been interested in for a long time, I knew next to nothing about any form of Native American history or culture despite the fact that that's a part of my ancestry. Um, so for my senior show, I decided to learn more about Native American history and the specific nation that I decided to focus on was the Osage Nation because of my minimal family background from that. Um, as you can see here, this is a map of the Osage ancestral territory, um, much of Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, parts of Louisiana. Um, what I discovered in my research is that um, the story of the Osage Nation is an unusual one compared to many other Native American um, nations in the sense that the height of their expanse coincided with Euro-American settlers for a time. Um, the, one could say that the peak of their expanse was around the turn of the 18th century. Um, what changed was the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> Um, a previously peaceful relationship with French traders was replaced by American settlers moving west. Um, and the Osage, among with many other uh, Native American people groups, were eventually relocated to reservations over the course of the 19th century. And that little purple square is the Osage Reservation. That was how much territory they ceded over the 19th century. Um, for the sake of time, I won't be going into a lot of what they experienced during that relocation, um, but I don't want to downplay that. The packed quarters and scarce means led to illness, poverty, and death, not just among the Osage, but all of the other people groups have been relocated. There was essentially a conflict amongst the Native Americans for land um, that had become necessary for survival. Um, and this state of poverty continued in this reservation through the 19th century. And these events seemed to momentarily fade away because in 1897, oil was discovered on the Osage Reservation. A lot of it. <laughs> um, overnight, the Osage people became the wealthiest people group per capita in the world. Um, in 1906, Congress passed... Um, an allotment act, which gave land specifically to individual Osage people in the reservation. But with this came the qualification of a governmental guardian, a white representative from the federal government to manage their finances because it was believed that the Osage people couldn't handle their finances on their own. What this eventually turned into, of course, um, was abuse on the part of the guardians of stealing those finances, taking bribes, essentially corruption descended onto the Osage Reservation. And things came to a head in the early 1920s. Between 1921 and 1924, at least two dozen Osage people were killed in various means for their money through shootings, poison, and on one occasion, the demolition of an Osage residence. The killings became so frequent that the newly founded Federal Bureau of Investigation became involved. And there was a full-blown FBI case on the reservation that resulted in a man by the name of William Hale being imprisoned in 1929 on the count of one murder. None of the other cases laid against William Hale or the other corrupted officials managed to stick, and none of them were imprisoned. 
1925, Congress passed a law that none of the allotments with oil could be passed to anyone of less than half Osage ancestry. When I first heard about these events, my initial reaction was one of shock and confusion. Um, I was confused as to why I had not heard of it before. It seemed like a pretty important chapter in US history as one of the first big FBI cases. Um, there was a lot at stake for the FBI, specifically at this time. If they didn't manage to crack the case, it would not look good on them. There was a lot at stake for them. So despite the fact that, as generally, we know very little about Native American culture, the fact that the FBI was involved struck me as something that should be more commonly known. I was surprised to find out that I was not alone in my ignorance. Many of my peers and family members and friends were equally confused when I told them about what I'd read. Um, I, I couldn't understand and to some extent still don't understand how this has been forgotten. We are flawed people. <laughs> um, but the emotional and mental turmoil that I've had to address since coming across this narrative have, has been uh, significant. And, and I'm sure many of us, with the questions of social justice comes the question of responsibility, any actions that we can take or should take. Lots of questions. Um, I was left wondering for a time what I, a white college student, could possibly do to understand or to share my findings or to even begin to take steps of reconciliation. It seemed that my senior show had become pointless and futile. But after being in conversation with my family, peers, and professors, I came to the conclusion that even the smallest of steps can be a step in the right direction. My senior show then became an attempt not only to bring understanding to myself, but to communicate this chapter of history to others. If we could switch to the next slide, Scott. These are pieces from the work that I've created um, over the past six months. Um, the work for my senior show is concept art for what may become a graphic novel, an animation project of some kind, something bigger further down the line of an original story set during these events in the 1920s. You'll see the image on your right, nope, your left, <laughs> um, is a character turnaround design for an original protagonist by the name of Steven. Um, during this time, uh, Osage people would have a, would be given a traditional Osage name at birth, but would then go to Catholic school and receive a Christian name. Um, and so my story is about Stephen kind of witnessing these events and grappling with them um, in so many ways. Um, the other image is a color script examining certain color schemes and lighting of various key moments um, in the story. Um, it was an attempt for me to kind of create a color palette um, that not just dealt with the gravity of these events and the sorrow, but also had a visual appeal to it. I'm, I'm generally consider myself a fairly lighthearted person in that I enjoy kind of Disney films and the more <laughs> fluffiness, one could say. And I, I wanted that to, I wanted there to be some kind of levity, I guess is the word, um, to the story as well. So I wanted to find a color palette that kind of combined both of those, um, if possible. All right, and then the next image, Scott. And then this was my final piece that I created uh, for a class last quarter. Um, Oklahoma has a very different landscape and weather than we have here in Seattle. And something that I found was quite common is tornadoes and thunderstorms. And I thought that could be a great visual way to incorporate um, some of the emotion that's attached to this chapter of um, Osage history. Um, this project has helped me in many ways to grapple with all of this. I think after a long time before dealing with this project, I took the easy way out in that I attempted to ignore social justice and injustice because it was the easier route. Um, and after dealing with this, I can't do that anymore. Um, 
and I think that's a good thing, but it's been hard. Um, so I'm looking forward to continuing work on this project and moving forward with it and hopefully starting conversations and um, thoughts about something that our country has forgotten in many ways. Um, thank you. about 15 minutes or so, so it's for conversation and questions and um, thoughts as well. Are there, um, first of all, thank you for coming. I um, appreciate you guys. Um, also, I was wondering if there's any programs like that or anything that's happening like on campus right now that could be incorporated with social justice and art like that's happening right now. You, you mean like the game one that I was working yeah. in? Yeah. Um, I'm not working on anything right now, but I love those kind of projects. So if you're interested in doing anything, I'd love to. Uh, I think they really generate from the person so or the team that you're working on. We, we were open to do anything other, I mean the game was just one thing that came out of that. So um, yeah. My office is in the corner. Yeah, <laughs> find me. Um, I know Tori mentioned that she wanted to keep going with her project, but do any of you have any projects that you haven't, any issues that you haven't addressed through projects that you might want to in the future? Well, one of the things we did was bring other works that are might be interesting for you. I brought a few graphic novels. One is called Drown City, and it's about New Orleans and the issues that occurred there. Um, there's also one called Strange Fruit, which are uncelebrated histories of, of African Americans, let, you know, sort of ordinary people who did extraordinary things. Um, we have a book about um, Zi Lin, who's a Chinese artist. Um, and he uh, did, did a whole series of drawings about the Chinese railroads, or the, the, the railroads in the West that were built by Chinese workers. Um, for myself, uh, the one project where I address these issues was a project called the Western Ball, which was a lengthy meditation on um, the Western Wall in Jerusalem and is kind of a centerpiece of, of Western philosophy and theology and where this uh, has been an obstacle or a place of uh, salvation. And so some of the sort of sub-chapters in that body of work were uh, focused on individuals who the Western wall or the Western theology um, became an obstacle. So I focused on the um, theologian, paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who er was early to write about evolution, but he wrote about it and the Catholic Church exiled him to China, wouldn't allow him to publish his work. And uh, so he found the Peking Man in China, and after he died, his books uh, could be published, his books about evolution. Um, so those are some things um, where there's injustice to a particular individual that, you know, there's a leveling over time that can occur. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm not working on anything. I'm doing kind of dumb project right now. But, um, uh, Scott, actually, our colleague Scott, I would say, of yeah, any of us right now, is involved in kind of large history. Big, big, do you want to talk about what you're doing? No, no, no. <laughs> It's really important. I say Scott is the Hogarth of, of uh, the modern era, um, and I really, really love this project he's doing. Um, so I, I, I think it's important. Uh, I really, I don't want to take spotlight. There will be some posters and propaganda distributed soon. <laughs> this project because it's a collaboration with the music, some music faculty and stuff like that too. But. Uh, yeah, keep the spotlight over there. Right. So one of the one of the areas that I'm focusing on is actually curriculum. 
And so we're, like in VizCom 1, we're looking at uh, bringing in our kind of cultural narrative, cultural interests, um, and then how, when those interests are threatened, is that a way of looking at social justice? Is that looking at like you getting involved in your narrative? So we're trying to look at it in ways within our curriculum. The other thing is in design history. Um, you, my design history students, help me expand this, but we're really looking at some of our research projects that are hard, actually, because like we were just talking about a, a, a female Russian artist in the early 1900s that study with Chagall, and you don't even know her name, and there's like two sentences. It's Emeril um, Eugenia Marmoral. And so we're having these conversations of how, more about, in, you know, not rewriting history, but including people in history. So I, I would say my issues are happening a little bit more in, uh, we're dealing in information design, if any seniors, we're dealing with uh, the issue of homelessness here in Seattle, so I, I think mine is definitely in curriculum, more than probably, or independent studies, but yeah, than my own work. Yeah. yeah. And then for me, just kind of continuing with my project is kind of the place I'm at with now. Hopefully soon I'll be able to look at other things beyond the horizon. Um, do you think you could say a little bit more about the project um, for curriculum and homelessness? Uh, yeah, and that one, that's an information design project. And so one of the challenges I think for my students, I've got a couple sitting here, is we talk a lot about a design and empathy. And how does one empathize with these very difficult discussions, very difficult situations? Seattle is not an easy place because um, we all, as we know, we all live here. and so. One of the things is going out and interviewing, going out and experiencing people that I'm looking at my seniors right now because they're in the project, but uh, interviewing, having interviews with people that are either helping out or assisting with homelessness um, or persons that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, with that, then retranslating this kind of dialogue into information graphics and designs that actually tell a story as opposed to just simply informing us that, you know, 32% uh, uh, homelessness has increased. Like, uh, Jen, I don't know if it was yours, or I was just looking at one of my students, for example. The good news is there are some pockets of Seattle that more persons are experiencing less homelessness, like some youth, because we've opened up some beds. But the bad news is home, the homeless numbers have actually increased, so then who is where, where is that population and, and what have we kind of taken, robbed Peter to pay Paul? So uh, these are the kinds of conversations that we're able to get into and um, hopefully have some spaces for empathy because I do think empathy plays a big role in, in justice, yeah. We also, actually in my capstone class too, we do it there too, where students have to identify an issue like Tori has identified that's meaningful for themselves, and how then can that manifest itself into some sort of uh, graphic medium? And so we deal with depression a lot. Of depression issues are there. Uh, health, the health crisis, the insurance crisis. There's a, there's a lot of issues that you young people are really they're big. They're big issues. And so how can we use our gifts and our talents to communicate or um, respond or relate to? Yeah. And, and we're fine. There's a couple of fine art projects that come to mind um, where it's not so much the, the artwork itself that becomes the um, event of uh, encounter. I, I think with Kara Walker, the artwork itself becomes an event for a larger population to encounter what she encountered that became the uh, cat catalyst for creating the works. So these these three words, they're not um, they're not stable positions. Sometimes an event happens first, and then there is uh, an encounter, and then the creation. Sometimes, uh, you know, you may have the creation, and then the event is in the audience looking at the work, and that's where 
the encounter happens, but I'm thinking of two particular um, individuals that used art as a way to affect social change. One is Tim Rollins and KOS, where he started working in um, the school system with kid in New York, yeah, was in New York. with um, kids that no one wanted to work with, and he helped them to read, taught them to read, um, and then the kids would make artworks out of the books that they were reading. <coughs> and then Tim Rawl, these large collaborative artworks would go on the block for sale, and then that money could be bought more books, you know, where these were very lower, they didn't have funding. Um, another, there's actually a number of artists engaged in things like this, but there's a film, Born into Brothels, which docu uh, documents this photographer who went to India to do a, a photojournalist project about um, the, the red light district in India, in one, I guess it was in Calcutta, one city, and um, as she was working on this project, she met the kids who were born into the brothels. And so she decided to teach the kids photography. And so she did a similar thing where she took the photographs that the kids made, took them to Manhattan, and they sold those. She took that money and then worked on ways to get these kids because Prostitution is illegal, so the kids born into the brothels can't go to school. And so she took this money and then worked with finding ways to get these kids out and into schools. So there's, a, uh, there's Vic Munoz, who's working in Brazil, um, where he works with the trash workers. You know, where, uh, the film is Wasteland. Is the, the title of the film is a documentary about how he creates these giant works of art with the garbage in the recycling center with the folks who are working in the recycling center and a similar thing with the large photograph then goes for sale and then this money comes back to that community. So there's some really, just heartfelt good projects where people are, artists are using art to be engaged in social action and justice issues. And uh, those are the three that come to mind right now. Um, so I think there are different ways that, that these things are done. It's not just, I, I, I have empathy for this subject and I'm gonna make a work about it and show it to you. Some people are actually engaged and involved and I think they all have a very important um, part to play in how things can be done, where you're working within what is your, not, I don't want to say comfort zone. I think we're all kind of called to work in the world in different ways. And um, anyway, anyway, yeah. We also, the last slide has a bunch of resources on it that if you're interested, we can just send you a PDF of that. So. Um, links to some design studios that are doing some great work. Uh, top link is for designers and so forth. It was the 2000 First Things First Manifesto in which um, uh, designers all over the world came together <coughs> and said, wait, we're sick of being used to just promote corporations. We actually want to use our skills to uh, change the world. And then in that same link is actually a whole list of designers and design studios working on social activism and, and so forth. So just ask, we'll get that out to anyone that wants that. Because I think, it's, I think it's exciting, personally, I think it's exciting to be able to use the gifts that God gave you as an opportunity to really uh, deal with some really tough issues. Um, AIGA for Good, we have a great chapter here in Seattle. It's called Design for Good, Design for Social Change, or Change Makers series. So every year, uh, designers all around Seattle pick a topic. Last year, it was, or this coming year, was education. And so then small teams of creative professionals, you, Abby, could be part of that. And you work on big problems and try to figure that out. And some, some really cool things come out of that. So. So it's not just, 
I'm just raising a picket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although that was fun. It was fun. <laughs> Perfect timing. This is, are there any other questions? Thoughts? Well, please join me in thinking.